Hi, a very good day to everybody. With this uh, video, I aim to accompany the launch of the latest paper published by the Center for Market Education entitled Fighting COVID-19 in Malaysia, Mass Testing and Other Reasonable Proposals. Contrary to other papers that we have released uh, before, this is a very long one, uh, close to 100 pages. And therefore, we have thought uh, to have a sort of intermediate version between the paper and the executive summary, a detailed explanation of the main contents of the paper through slides. So for the ones that want to dig beyond the media statement and the executive summary, but do not have the time to uh, read the whole paper for the moment, we attach these slides and uh, this uh, little introduction to the slides. Let me share my screen. Okay, here you can see the cover, uh, the cover page of our paper. Uh, a paper that uh, open with uh, a quotation from uh, Nobel laureate in economics, Friedrich von Hayek. Uh, which uh, warns us from the risks that emergencies have always posed on mankind in the sense that emergencies have always been the pretext uh, to erode individual liberty. And there is always the high risk that emergency intended as something temporary can persist in the long run because they are terribly appealing from the political perspective. Now, this is the title, which I already mentioned, as, and as you can see, the paper is uh, co-authored by me with other scholars, not only from Malaysia, but also from Italy, and from the UK, and from people uh, from the civil society um, here in Asia. Uh, in particular, I would uh, like to mention the scientist Salvatore Chirumbolo, the economist uh, uh, Consul Stan and uh, the tax expert uh, Verinderjit Singh, people that eventually uh, some of them can be familiar to you here in Malaysia. Which are the main findings uh, uh, of this paper? We have divided the main findings into medical, into medical perspective and economic perspective. So from uh, the medical perspective in general, it is important to say and to recognize something that now has been confirmed by latest research and uh, that uh, SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 is not um, an airway uh, in inflammatory disease like flu, but instead is a cardiovascular disease. Another important aspect that we want to stress is that COVID-19 has a syndemic character. In a nutshell, it means that if you are young and healthy, you have a very low chance to develop heavy symptoms or to die from COVID-19, while the virus instead works in a very uh, dangerous way uh, in presence of other non-communicable disease or in elderly people. This is something very important to, to note as uh, we, we will see in a while in order for people to better assess their individual risk. Now let's see at some numbers of COVID-19. Unfortunately, the paper stopped the 17th June. So, uh, we, we had to stop collecting data at a certain point, but I will comment on the latest evolutions in this video. So as per 17 June, Malaysia recorded a little less than 700,000 COVID-19 infection and a uh, little more than 4,000 deaths linked to COVID-19, which means that 2% of the population has tested positive and 0.61% of the positive cases or 0.012% of the population has lost life for complication due to the virus. The survival rate is extremely high in Malaysia, 19.39% when compared to a 98% worldwide. 
The situation now is worsening, but I believe that is worsening not only because of the variants, but because our healthcare system is uh, uh, left uh, guiltily, I think, um, unprepared to face the surge in uh, infections that we have experienced recently. So not enough has been spent to strengthen our uh, healthcare system, as we will see in a short while. Some more data about Malaysia. The average death age uh, from COVID-19 is 65.8, and the median death age is 67. In fact, 71% of the deaths were recorded among individuals aged 60 and above. Furthermore, almost 86% of the COVID-19 deaths happen in presence of at least one comorbidity. And the most recorded uh, illnesses were high blood pressure and diabetes. In the paper, you will find much more details on this. You will uh, see really uh, a table with the different comorbidities, the different age groups. So just look for that tables if you want to check your personal uh, risk of death from COVID-19. But um, as we produce a policy paper, a policy paper needs to be attentive uh, to the complexity of the scenario. And therefore, uh, the medical aspect cannot but take into consideration also the economic perspective. Let's remember that in policy, there are never solutions, there are only trade-offs. And the analysis of the trade-offs so far, I say, has been very poor in Malaysia when developing anti-COVID uh, policies. In particular, the policy response has been based on the assumption of a sort of super knowledge possessed by the state. Let's remember that the government, the agencies, the ministries are always limited group of people. They are not superhuman. Their knowledge is not superior to the ones of the men on the street. Indeed, the knowledge that is necessary to implement some policies is often dispersed in the mind of individuals. And therefore, decentralized decision process can produce better outcome when compared to centralized decision processes. As uh, I mentioned, the trade-off analysis and the, 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 the policy response has been very poor so far in Malaysia and has been mainly based on a blind faith in lockdowns. We have heard many times that we need to implement lockdown to break the chain of infections. No scientist will, would sign a declaration saying that lockdowns can break the chain of infections. Simply doesn't work that way. Lockdowns are a temporary measures that can help you to buy time in order to develop a true anti-COVID strategy, which has to be based on strengthening the healthcare system, the medical response. Lockdown is a non-medical response. We have to strengthen the medical response to COVID-19. Instead, if we don't use the time of the lockdown, like we have not done, in the past several lockdowns to strengthen the healthcare system, we are not buying, buying time, we are wasting time. And indeed, through lockdowns, we are also uh, weakening the immune system of individuals. Uh, therefore, after every lockdown, the number of infections raise, the mortality raise. This is because the people that re-enter the normal life are weakened people. People that have not been exposed to fresh air, people that have not been exposed to sunlight, people that have not practiced uh, proper exercise, that have over ate, overeaten, and uh, that have suffered mental uh, stress. Furthermore, the approach to lockdown is wrong because the focus is to minimize infections when the scientific literature supports the idea that we should increase infections, but in a targeted way, protecting the vulnerable and accelerating the transformation of the pandemic into an endemic uh, uh, by allowing the young and healthy to get rapidly infected. 
So a constantly low R0, like the one that uh, the, the policymakers in Malaysia have constantly looked for, will make the pandemic to last up to 20 years. The graph that you can see here is from Science, one of the most prestigious academic uh, journal. And you can see in the first quadrant here on the top that uh, with an R0 of two, the pandemic will take 10 years to become endemic. Imagine that our um, health experts want to keep R0 below one. This means prolonging the pandemic up to double the time, 20 years. Instead, if we want to get rid of the pandemic fast, that means not to reduce infections, but to reduce mortality through the development of herd immunity, we need to have an R0 of six. Of course, you can afford to have R0 six only if you are medically prepared to treat uh, the uh, the higher number of people that get infected. This is the key. Your uh, healthcare system need to be prepared and ready. So given these premises, we can say that from a healthcare perspective, a balanced trade-off analysis has been missing from an economic perspective, sorry. And uh, let's not forget that uh, generalized movement restrictions affect mostly the poor. So they are terribly regressive. And they have brought an increase in unemployment, underemployment, and poverty. Currently, the number of those struggling to make ends meet, that means people that are either unemployed or underemployed, is more than 700 times higher than the number of people who died from COVID-19. Okay, and uh, let's not forget that just in 2020, with one lockdown only, uh, the number of uh, people living uh, below uh, the poverty line has been increased from 5.6 to 8.9 percent. And also in 2020, so before MCO 2.0, before MCO 3.0, before full MCO, before EMCO, the number of uh, unemployed among the urban poor in the Klang Valley rose from 7 to 15 percent. I cannot figure out, I cannot really I don't want to think at how big these figures could be at the end of 21 after the uninterrupted series of lockdowns that we are experiencing. So let's talk frankly with numbers, with figures about trade-offs. So um, two economists working in Malaysia, Jeffrey Williams and Paolo Casadio, have estimated that treating all the people that have been infected with COVID-19 so far have costed 8 billion uh, ringgit, while, and this is instead the uh, Center for Market Education estimation, the annual lockdown cost is 12% of the GDP or 170 billion. Remember that the full lockdown, according to the Ministry of Finance, cost 2.4 billion ringgit per day, per day. What does this mean? This means that uh, a more balanced trade-off analysis would have suggested to invest and save resources into treatments, equipment, ICU uh, units, oxygen, temporary hospitals. The cost would have been a fraction of the cost generated by lockdowns. Uh, lockdowns, by the way, don't have real medical benefit. Instead, by investing in the healthcare, we could have treated the people and avoid not only COVID mortality, but also avoiding people that die because they don't get proper care for other illnesses to die. We would have avoided suicides. We would have avoided uh, deaths from poverty. This is very important. So if the cost has been 8 billion, let's say that with 20 billion, we could have cured everybody and um, avoid unemployment. And uh, we could have avoided all the stimulus packages, and we could have avoided um, uh, the high cost of lockdowns. On top of these, uh, lockdowns have made necessary uh, expansionary fiscal and monetary policies, which together with supply side shocks are triggering inflationary processes, which may become unfortunately out of control after the COVID-19 emergency is over, putting the foundation 
for a deep economic crisis. This means that now inflation is kept at bay because we have deflation coming from the crisis. But once the crisis is over and we have no more deflation, how can we control the inflation created by injection of money, by printing money and by excessively low um, uh, interest rate? We need to reverse this path if we don't want to break the recovery after COVID-19. And this is a graph that I elaborated. In blue, you can see the GDP annual growth rate, um, the, the actual behavior from the end of 2019 until the first quarter of 2021. And in orange, instead, you can see my prediction. This graph is simply saying that I don't expect any growth for this year. And we will be lucky if we are not in negative territory. So let's assume for sake of simplicity, almost flat or little negative growth for this year, but maybe worse if lockdowns continue. Uh, let's assume that somehow, uh, somewhere next year, the uh, crisis will be over and then the economy will start to recover. This recovery will bring more inflationary pressures. And when the central bank will have to raise the interest rate, we can face uh, a post-COVID economic crisis. We need to avoid this. And the way to avoid this is just avoiding lockdown and stopping uh, pumping money into the economy. This is uh, to, to explain it in very, in very simple terms. Now, we have so far analyzed the problem, which is the proposal that uh, uh, the Center for Market Education in this paper uh, brings out. First of all, we repeat lockdowns do not work and can make the situation even worse by prolonging the pandemic and compromising the physical and mental health of a much higher number of people. So they should be uh, immediately abandoned together with uh, questionable measures such as the distinction between essential and non-essential services. Let me spend a few words on this distinction between essential and non-essential services. As you can see, because of the um, lockdown, my hair are growing long. The government can eventually tell me that it's not essential for me to cut my hair. But how can the government tell my barber that it's not essential for him and his family to be fed for a certain number of months until the government decides it is moment for them to reopen? Every business is essential to bring food at the table of at least one person. Nobody is inessential. Everybody needs to eat, first point. Second point, the economy is complex. Whoever have worked one day in life would know that such a distinction is impossible to be drawn. And I give you another very simple example based on a business that I know very well. Nobody would question that chicken are eventually essential. Chicken production is essential. Chicken are born in machines uh, that are called incubators. Each incubator is made of 3,500 different parts. So it means that if you want chicken to get to get uh, to life, to get born, you need to have 3,500 suppliers to work to provide that pieces, together with those who produce the sprays, the clothes for the hatcheries, the equipment for the incubators, the transport, and etc. The supply chain, the value chains are too complicated to be uh, divided into black and white. This is not possible. To spend time into looking for a rational division between essential and non-essential is irrational and useless. So what do we propose? First of all, we believe that because of variance, limited time efficacy, efficacy and supply side constraint, vaccination cannot be our only practical response. Vaccination needs to be there. We need to improve vaccines. Uh, we, we need to grow in better, uh, better vaccines, but this is not enough. The first change should be move from generalized restrictions to focus protection, which means protecting vulnerable categories, elderly and sick, and allow instead targeted infection for faster immunity development. This is the first suggestion. Second, pharmaceutical and medical research should be enhanced. Uh, for a long-term treatment. The research on uh, ivermectin uh, and other controversial medicines should not be abandoned. 
look at India. After the surge in COVID deaths, India was able to control uh, the deaths uh, with a widespread use of ivermectin. We may not be sure about its working, but we can't discourage research. Research is very important, and we need to arrive at a pharmacological protocol for COVID-19. Together with this, we need to let the people out to strengthen their immune system. Physical activity, supplements consumption, meditation, alternative uh, medicines, Chinese medicine, and etc., should be incentivized. Closing the public park is a non scientific SOP. Keeping the kids at home is a non scientific SOP. This is just will of power and control from the political authority. The more practical um, suggestion that we have, the gold standard for returning to normal uh, personal and economic lives while allowing the virus to circulate in the community and to develop herd immunity is what we call mass frequent and affordable testing. This means allowing firms and schools to operate, but testing individuals on a weekly basis basis making possible early detection and therefore avoidance asymptomatic spread not only avoiding asymptomatic spread but also avoiding the asymptomatic people to uh, develop uh, heavy symptoms and to get caught uh, too late in a too uh, late stage but for this to happen we can't rely only on pcr tests we need to liberalize rapid test kits saliva and etc because the costs of this other test is much cheaper than the PCR test. It's more affordable for businesses, and uh, even they are able to get uh, the, to catch the infectivity status when uh, it is more important to be, to be caught, when individuals are more likely to spread the virus. So it is important to give options and to recognize the validity of these tests in order to make mass testing and tracing frequent and affordable. The cost can, of tests can be borne by businesses, but the amounts should be made tax deductible through the tax return. Obviously, increasing testing and tracing will require investment in additional hospital beds and medical equipment, because we will uh, uh, even find more uh, in people that are infected, people that we don't know are currently infected. And for this, an entrepreneurial innovation based on the cooperation between uh, private and public health care is necessary. So far, probably the burden of uh, COVID-19 has been too much on the public health care system alone. Uh, the private system needs to um, enter the game into a virtuous uh, circle for really breaking the chain of infections uh, in a serious way and, and to develop also yeah, me medical, medical uh, innovations uh, through government incentives, but also with the cooperation of the private, the private sector. A final word on the role of experts. Remember that experts are always fallible people. Experts have different opinions. In science, nothing is uh, written in the rocks. Nothing is there forever. Indeed, scientific developments happen through debate and through doubt, never on the ipsa dixit. Uh, it has been said like that. No, this is not science. Um, therefore, we, don't, we cannot simply have experts to take decisions on our life. We need the government to give the stage to different and competing group of experts in order to allow individuals to make better informed decisions. Finally, our plan obviously will have a cost and we realize that we need a financial effort. If we stop lockdowns, uh, obviously the GDP can grow, we can have more resources. So the first way to create resources is stopping lockdowns. Another uh, three proposals that we have here are, first of all, a special purpose tax of 5% on profits above a certain threshold. We can call them super profits. But this tax 
uh, at the light of a new social pact between businesses and the state need to be clearly temporary and based on the promise of no further lockdown. Furthermore, we need the commitment of the government uh, that the collective revenues should be linked to anti-COVID investments in the medical field. Second, the reintroduction of a targeted and multi-layer GST to be collected at state rather than federal level, where be, whereby the excess collection on the previous ST, SST should be invested to medically fight COVID-19. So let's remember that we are in a medical emergency and a medical emergency need to be treated with medical response. Finally, a percentage tax designation institutions. Business and individuals should be given the chance of allocating a percentage of their taxes up to 2% per year to investments to fight COVID-19. Uh, the more technical details on how this uh, solutions can technically work can be found in detail in, uh, in the paper. So the Center for Market Education hopes that this can really be seen as a true plan to fight COVID-19, as a true strategy to fight COVID-19. We try to give our contribution to this uh, common fight and we hope to find uh, ears ready to listen to these suggestions that we believe are very reasonable and implementable. And hopefully a new leadership in Malaysia uh, can arise to bring a, a new response to an emergency that had lasted already too long. This is all from the Center for Market Education. Let's keep in touch and we hope uh, that uh, we can be an active part uh, in this fight through our intellectual contribution. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you very much.